Hey, what's going on, everybody? Um, welcome to the show tonight. Thank you for joining in. Um, you know, we have a couple topics I want to touch upon tonight before uh, we head into our normal uh, podcast um, routine. So the guest today is Eddie with, um, he does Blue Tree Monitors, known as Follow Blue also. Um, I do want to touch up on the FWC uh, happenings that happened on uh, last Thursday and what's going on, what the community is doing overall and what the community here in Florida is doing. So um, I'm going to bring Eddie on. Let me get a couple more people on here. Make sure you hit the, the like, subscribe to our channels, and um, we're going to get that this podcast going. Let me see. Get this going. And we're going to bring on Eddie. Hey, what's up, Eddie? What's up? What's up, man? It's uh, good to have you, you know. I've been uh, watching some of your... For sure. I've been watching some of your stuff on Instagram, and it's pretty uh, interesting, you know. It makes me want to definitely, you know, get into some kind of monitors, too, now that, you know, seeing what you're doing with them. And uh, I like how you're you're very, like, immersive in doing, um, taking care of them, the husbandry. This is pretty Yeah, man, thank you, you Thank you, man. Yeah, I just I kind of like, you know, fell into this and, and I've had so much fun with the community that I've been growing. And, you know, I have, I have such a big passion for the tree monitors. I've always been into like monitors in general. But when I got into tree monitors, I just fell in love with them so passionately. And I'm, I've been loving the, the, the road that they've been taking me on. You know, man, it's been so much fun, honestly. For sure, man. For sure. So um, before we get into like our normal uh, podcast, you know, Q and A, and just getting to know you and and the animals you're working with, um, you know, I'm pretty sure you've heard of what's going what happened here down um, in Florida with the Fish and Wildlife yeah, Commission yeah, yeah. Um, yep, last yeah. Thursday. <clears throat> you know, I wanted to see, you know, what's your thoughts on it. You know, what you think we as a community can do better, and how we can support each other so this doesn't happen again. Yeah, man, it's it's such an unfortunate thing to hear uh, what happened, you know, with the regulations that they have down there. They're just so strict and it's it, it's so it's so messed up that they don't have any other options and to euthanize these animals in the manner they did uh, them going to step forward, you know, or, or, or pat, you know, kind of like going over out of bounds and, and actually killing the gentleman's like pet boa. That was kind of really messed up. You know, it goes to show that these guys have no like official training as much as they should on, you know, identifying these species. Imagine if it was like something like Mr. super Jeremy rare, right? Like, like, like imagine if these guys killed like, like a, a one of those, uh, what's it called? Those, those tempered species boas, the Madagascar, like mountain boa or something like that, you know, like something that's like so hard to like replace, you know, like then how do you respond to something like that? Or, or it, it, it just, it's, it's a bad thing, dude, you know? And, and I think it goes in both hands because, you know, when reading the reports, and I, I'm not taking any sides, right? What, what, what they did was the commission did was ho a horrendous act. Um, but what the gentleman did in terms of not being prepared for relocating these animals, I think he was in the wrong as well. Because he knew that he had a time limit. He knew he had a certain amount of time to, to, to rehome these animals and didn't do it in time, right? Like, there, whatever, whatever there is, the fact of the matter is he knew there was a timeline and they didn't get sorted out fast enough whether he didn't have the 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 the, re the avenues to do so or not he put himself in a position in which those animals got killed due to him the way he did he did things right but at the way that the florida fish and wildlife handled that situation was just was just horrible honestly man you know what man and i agree because you know i, I... I think you always got to look at both ends of the spectrum of what's going on, you right? Um, and I, I, I share the same thoughts as you, you know, like, um, you know, I know there's been videos out from 2021 where the commissioner mentioned that, you know, that these animals would have been grandfathered in after that law was passed to ban it, but they didn't. Right. They decided that, you know, um, they're going to have to, you know, everybody that has his pets or, you know, has these animals are going to have to get rid of them. 
Um, you know, and, and like I said, I've read some of the articles and listened from stories from uh, uh, US, uh, US Arc Florida and their board members. Um, <clears throat> and it's interesting, interesting because like you said, there maybe could have been certain avenues of approach where um, to try to get these animals out of the state, right? Um, you know, and maybe the gentleman didn't exhaust all his options before it got to where it's at, uh, you know, and, and it gives you a um, idea like you can't um, put your trust on all, all your trust on a government entity too. You know, they have, they have very strict guidelines that they're not going to um, move around for no one really most of the time. Right, you know? right. And it's, and it's most, most any government entity that you deal with. They have their guidelines and that's it, it's in stone. Um, so, you know, I know he called, so, you know, from what I've heard and read, he called um, FWC when his time was up to rehome these and told, told them that, hey, I don't have, I have these X amount of animals still left. And I wasn't able to rehome them. And I think that's when FWC came in and then cited him, I guess, two citations per per animal that he still had. And then uh, he's right. actual. Criminal, you know, he, he has criminal uh, charges against him. He went on probation. And then when I guess when this case started opening up after his charges, he um, they after you see told him, OK, you can't rehome these animals right now. You can't move them out of state. You can't even euthanize them, you know, because they're uh, evidence to the case now. Right. What happened was, you know, I think like maybe like. A couple weeks ago, the case got finally got settled and closed, and then FWC came in to oh, wow. um, check in. Well, things are, are developing, right? You know, FWC is going to start putting stuff out to, you know, um, try to cover their end of it. Right, uh, right, of course. You know, of course. A couple people got some e messages that they had tagged on Instagram, the Fish and Wildlife Commission. A conservation uh, Instagram, and they got uh, messages saying that you know um, the reason that FWC showed up to do a check was because they had recently found a uh, yeah, Burmese I heard about this. escaped right near you know it, it's yeah. yeah yeah it's it's um it just seems too coincidental you know like the case yeah. his case closing. And then this animal, you know, after since 2021, none of these animals have escaped, you know. And then coincidentally, yeah. this animal escaped now, and FWC came to do a check, you know. Right. right. Um, so, you know, th that's the matter of fact there and stuff like that. But then where they were incompetent, really, um, just misidentifying. I, it's not even just misidentifying. I don't think they were being careful enough with the task they were doing and then they decided to um you know or they euthanized the um the boa by mistake right 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 yeah you and, it, and it, i think know, that, that's where it sets it to the next level you know yeah yeah and it's unfortunate but you know a, as these the story develops more we'll learn what really happened you know in the in the case of like the the burmese being found right if if this gentleman, and again, I don't know the gentleman, I don't know what the, what was actually happening or anything like that, but if this gentleman, if they said they had found a Burmese python, let's just say, let's just play devil's advocate and say it was true, they found one. What if this guy was a hot keeper and there was a cobra that had gotten out, right? Then how do you handle a situation like this? How do you, how dangerous is, is it for, you know, someone to like be that neglectful in that way to allow an animal to escape, whether it's a Burmese this, in this case, you know, again, I'm just playing devil's advocate. I don't know the gentleman. I don't know how this thing was handled. I think on both sides, it's unfortunate, man. You guys are getting kind of like just bombarded with all these like regulations and everything like that down there. And I think, I think it's pushing to a world like a, a, a nationwide ban, man. Honestly, on these animals, I think, I think what's happening is that these people see that there's too many like just irresponsible keepers. Because, I mean, to, to be quite honest, man, this doesn't look good for any of us. The fact that this guy had, you know, whatever amount of snakes killed, right, by the FWC, the FWC was neglectful and killed one of his animals. But the fact that it got to the point that they had to kill this many animals just goes to show that maybe there is a problem with this stuff in Florida. This is just one guy. Imagine how often this goes on in Florida and we just don't hear about it, man. You know, like, 
I don't know, dude. It's it's a scary situation to be in, and with with I, I just heard about last month. What was it? Uh, uh, was Ohio or, uh, or was uh, or Indiana was trying to ban was pushing some type of like law to ban all reptiles in the state? Like it's just it's growing more and more, dude. And it's just I don't know, man. It's a scary time, honestly, for reptile keepers, man. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it is, and I think you know we definitely need to keep together and do stuff like this to be able to be in the public eye. I know a lot of us don't want to be in the public eye. Um, you know, I, I never thought I'll be doing the podcast or YouTube, um, but I see that there is a need for it, you know, to be able to get our info, our animals in front of the general public and educate people. Yeah. Because that, that's the biggest yeah. thing. A lot of people are miseducated about right. reptiles. You know, they hear the, the common, um, you know, rumors or the BS, you know, um, stuff that people talk about, you know, like, there's people that think that all rep, all snakes are venomous, right? Yeah, it yeah, just, exactly. It just, it just gets wild. Um, you know, that's why I, I enjoy coming in here and um, hosting, you know, my guests and, and um, you know, um, talking about this stuff. And I think, you know, like you said, U.S. Arc and U.S. Arc Florida, you know, support is one of the biggest things, you know, supporting them, becoming memberships. Um, you know, I'm going to share... Their YouTube, their YouTube is linked down below. Also, their U, their website is linked down below. So, guys, please go and get a membership. Even if you don't live in Florida, it's gonna help us um, because U.S. Art Florida does have a lawsuit against right um, the FWC right now, and right. it's gonna cost a lot of money for lawyers. Um, they have scientific scientists on um, that they're reviewing certain species. You know, they're hiring a whole group of, of a whole team to be able to push this lawsuit against FWC. And look, I'm, I'm for regulations, too. You know, th there's there's got to be some kind of regulations and stuff like that. Um, but there's you, we also got to cut, you know, there's a thin line of what's overreaching and what's necessity. Right. Um, and I think what happened this past Thursday, it was definitely an overreach. Of what happened, I think, and so, it, it yeah. is. I agree. You know, because if 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 it wasn't in the hands of these, you know, three gentlemen to carry out the euthanization of all these animals, maybe that boa and the rest of the animals would have been euthanized. Uh, maybe right. if if they decided, hey, we're gonna take it to a veterinarian, or we're gonna take it, um, you know, or or the we're gonna escort the owner with all these animals to a certain location then maybe it would have been avoided. Um, right. You know? And right, I think right. that maybe there's uh, there's other ways of controlling these bans or if they're going to ban something instead of fully banning the animal. Um, you know, I was thinking about the other morning um, and, you know, I'm pretty sure most major cities, they have issues with um, feral cats, right? Just cats running around the you know, right, cities right, and right. reproducing. Well, the, the counties and the cities usually gather, at least I know in Miami Day, they gather animals, euthan uh, not euthanize them, um, spay and neuter them, and then release them back. Yeah, in right? order to prevent them from what? reproducing. Yeah, that's smart. Correct. So, what if, especially these big, uh, you know, reticulate pythons, these uh, Burmese pythons, stuff like that, what if, um, and these are pretty big animals, what if they, they said, okay, you can keep your animals. But you have to neuter or spay them to be able to still keep it and they won't reproduce and they won't cause more of an ecological, you know, or possibility for causing an ecological, um, you know, um, impaction and stuff like that. This, I, this think, I think that's a great idea. I think it's a know? great idea, yeah. I think what would happen, though, is that unfortunately, like, if they were put that onus on the reptile keeper to pay for it, no one's going to pay for it. I mean, you think about how many people go through like proper quarantine, uh, you know, for their animals or who, who take care of the animals in the correct manner, right? Like you can buy a what, a reticulated python that can get, you know, 14 feet for like 50 bucks at a fleet, at an at a, at a, at a animal show. And, and most of these guys are throwing them in tubs. They're not giving them giant cages. So let's say you got, you got to go take it out to get neutered and it's like $300 to get neutered. Who's going to pay that? No one, yeah. you know, and and then and then the vet, the, the government isn't going to pay for all these vet techs and now learn how to neuter reticulated pythons, 
You know, who's going to want to take that responsibility and possibly get bit by a 14 foot snake? You know, something that can hurt, that can damage your nerve system, you know, if it bites you. Like, that's the problem with this whole thing. In my opinion, man, you know, and I, I know it's going to sound kind of like, you know, it's two sided. I've kept these big animals, right? I've never, I don't know what it's like working with them. I don't know what it's like, you know, dealing with them. I honestly don't think we should be keeping these, man. I don't think we should be keeping these giant, four, and I don't, I don't know if you keep them or anything like that, so this is no offense to you or person, to anybody like that, but I don't think the average keeper should be keeping a reticulated python, an anaconda, a rock python, a Burmese. Like, these are massive animals that reproduce too efficiently, and we are, like, overbreeding the hell out of them and not giving them the correct place to put them, you know? Like... That's my saying, man. But then you can say that about everything, man. You can say that about every animal that we're over reproducing and we don't have enough of them. Like, look at the ball python market. There's 50,000 mm-hmm. pythons on, on morph market, not enough buyers for all the selling. But there, we don't have a problem yeah. there, right? So, like, it's, 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 like a, it's like a twofold problem, man. I, I, don't, I don't know which way to fix yeah. it. I just don't see it getting fixed anytime soon, unfortunately, man. Yeah. You know, and like you said, I, I don't keep, I keep Western hog noses mainly. Um, so they're all small animals. Uh, I personally wouldn't keep um, at, at this this point in my life and the point I'm with keeping animals. I wouldn't keep um, these big type of snakes. I don't know if yeah. years from now, you know, I you know grow my collection, maybe have a facility where I can have you know these massive cages and stuff like that, and I have more experience. Maybe then, yes. Um, but like you said, you know, everybody is open to their opinion. And for yourself, it seems right. like you wouldn't, you know, you don't, you don't see yourself like for you, it's not worth keeping these animals. Right. Or it's not I mean, needed. I, or... I think they're beautiful animals. I'm sure mm-hmm. that if we can keep them correctly, then there, there'll be amazing animals, but I've never seen, I, I mean, I, I rarely see a person give a reticulated Python, you know, an animal that gets, you know, massive, the proper size enclosure. Like I usually see them in what an eight foot by two foot by two foot enclosure. That's not big enough for a reticulated python. It sits in the corner and just wraps around because it has no movement, right? Like so, so if you're not able to provide them, like I would say, a, a python like that would need a minimum of, uh, the size of a room, right, to actually be able to live healthily, correctly, exercise, and everything like that. And if you're not providing that sort of stuff, then why keep an animal that you're going to just shove in a in like a in a small enclosure and barely see it? That's how I feel about that sort of thing, you know, but, you know, I come from a different mentality when it comes to animal keeping, like, obviously, at the end of the day, we're all keeping animal in, bo- in boxes, right? We're never going to be able to ever come close to what they are like in the, in the wild. But mm-hmm. if you're going to work with an animal with any sort in captivity, you should at least try to give it the most amount of space you can, not just go with the minimum, right? And, and so that's why I say, like, I don't think the average keeper should be keeping these type of animals. And they should be more so regulated to like zoos and, and zoological institutions that have the resources to actually take care of them. You know, in my opinion, like, I don't know. I see too much crazy stuff on the internet. Like, I don't know if you saw the other day, there was a video of a lady that put her hand inside of a, I think she was feeding, feeding a reticulated python inside of a fish tank. And you could see the animal squaring up, ready to bite her. And she just acts like it's normal. And it's, it bit the hell out of her. I don't know if it like, go. Oh, the video ended, but that goes to show like the misinformation that we have out there and, and people doing this sort of stuff, taking care of these animals in an incorrect manner that's hurting themselves and making us look bad. You know, when, when, F, when someone from FWC sees that video, they're going to be like, this animal is dangerous. We shouldn't keep that. Right. But we're going to keep on doing that and posting those videos up and causing this type of stir up where we're going to keep on getting animal bans. And I don't know. Sorry to go on that rant, dude. I'm just like, I get sure no, no, man, for this sure. sort of stuff, you know? Yeah. <laughs> no, and I get it, man. You know, and, and I think every community um, has, you know, and I'm going to say those bad apples that aren't keeping the animal correctly or doing right. some of the sensational, you know, especially nowadays, I think with um, the, the uh, what's it called? With social media, people people want their, their 15 seconds of fame, right? Um, so right, they're, they're right. trying to do certain things to drum up more followers and stuff like that and like you said if, if they're doing stuff like that or, or not proper keeping you know properly handling the animals then of course it's going to get attention and it's going to eventually maybe the, the 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 what's it called the u.s you know 
FWC or any of the, the governing bodies of you know the wildlife or captive animals might not see it, but somebody's going to get upset and report it, or might send yeah, it man. to that to that uh, you know that entity where it starts a snowball effect. Um, right. And that's why I say you know we we if we're going to do if we're going to put ourselves out in social media, it needs to be educational, professional, right? I agree. Um, I agree. Yeah. You know because. I was talking with one of my friends earlier about this, and one of the big things in the reptile community, um, a lot of people call it just a hobby. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. I, pers I personally like calling it a community. And then, you know, if you're running a business, then you are running a business. If you're, if you're breeding animals for monetary gain, it is a business. You know, don't yeah, people try to um, justify it? Oh, it's a hobby, and I'm maybe it's paying maybe for itself yeah side. and it's yeah. paying for itself yeah, yeah. i think at the end of the day it is a business and if we want the you know the u.s government our local governments to take us serious then we do have to portray ourselves as professional business people i agree you know? i agree i agree and um i think you know more people doing uh you know education you know we we, we started talking about you know on um May 10th and 11th, there's a Fish and Wildlife Commission meeting here in Miami, and we are planning, a lot of us planning to show up, and at some point of the meeting, usually at the end of one of the days, either day one or two, there's open floor discussion. Everybody, every person that wants to speak has three minutes to speak on anything oh, cool. that's not covered already during the agenda. Um, and one of the biggest things that we're telling people, if you're going to show up and we've talked to these different groups and stuff like that is make sure you stay professional, make sure you get your point across. It's only three minutes, right? Three minutes is not that long to get your point across to somebody, especially right. on, yeah. item, on items and, you know, issues that we're having right now. I agree. You know, yeah. So, you know, and I know a lot of us, you know, I, I watched that video, the video yesterday. I don't know if you watched it or not on the USR YouTube of the whole incident and man yeah I, I, um i i i watched it all because i wanted to see exactly what happened but i will not watch it again yeah i will not watch it yeah. again i think somebody had was, was playing it on their um on their uh one of their lives this today or yesterday again and i had to cut out for that moment and get back in because watching it once was enough you know um right, right and and man i'll give you a little bit of my background um I, i've been in the, i was in the marines i've been in combat and stuff like that so i've seen different things and i don't consider myself as a squeamish or person that looks away but when it's something so close you know to home it definitely um did hit me you know make me uh give me an emotional reaction and stuff like that you know, I agree, man. Um, yeah. It's not cool. You know, no, no, man. We, we definitely need to stick together and, and you know, contact. Uh, I have it in the link below, in the description below of this video. Um, contact Governor DeSantis, you know, message them, email them, uh, call their offices. Any little, uh, you know, information we can get out to them will help, you know, because we need to get these, these po uh, politicians on our side to be able to see, you know, what, what we see. So yeah, um, I agree, before man. we move on, I agree. you know, yeah, before we move on, I'm going to show um, the, the US ARC um, YouTube, you know, this is their, their cash app. If you want to do a quick donation, um, you know, if anybody's watching, do a quick donation, you can donate to them. Like I said, they're going to need a lot of funds to, you know, process the lawsuit that they currently have and plus you know add this issue that we just got we're dealing with right now onto that and as it has added as evidence um and then we have their youtube which they have the video here i'm not going to play it tonight um but i encourage people to go and at least try to watch certain bits and pieces so you're properly informed of what happened that day it's caught on video so it's not hearsay, you know, it's not one person's point of view. Right. Um, it's caught on video and you can actually see what happened. And, you know, and I got to say too, you see 
the two of the gentlemen that are not in uniform speak about what they're doing. And they say that they do not um, condone this or enjoy doing this, That, but it is part of their job. Um, I know the, the, the other guy in uniform, he was caught smiling during the process and stuff like that. So I think that behavior there definitely needs, needs to get uh, corrected by FWC and, you know, rooted out of their system, out of their, their organization, you know, yeah. just like, just like, you know, we would with any, um, you know, law enforcement, you know, if, if there's somebody that's taken pleasure or thinks it's a laughing matter when, you know, an animal or a person is dying or some kind of harsh, uh, I, you know, actions being done to them, to a person, they don't need to be in that part. They don't need to be in that, um, what's it called? Um, that type of line of work, right? Because you are right. a public servant, you know, um, and you're there, you're supposed to be there to help the community. Yeah, I agree. It so, could be dangerous to have someone like that, you know? For sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, you know, and we're humans, right? We are humans. Everybody makes mistakes. Um, and at the end of the day, what happened with the with the boa that was not supposed to be euthanized and that was not on the ban list was a mistake, but it was a careless mistake, and I 100% think it could have been avoided. I agree. You know? I agree. And then that's that's where I'm gonna um, you know end my thoughts on this, and I'm gonna keep putting information on my Instagram, my TikTok about what's going on. Um, about the meeting in um, here in Miami is going to happen with FWC. You know, if anybody can come out and join support, you know, um, it's much appreciated. The more we can show them that we are not just a small little community, you know, um, we can come out and show support for each other and really push um, the, the, you know, the correct way to deal with these animals. Um, then it's going to make a difference, but we need everybody's support. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah. Any final last thoughts on this, Eddie? Yeah, man, we all got to stick together and actually like work towards this stuff because it starts with this little thing right here. It starts with you guys in Florida, but you guys are the pushing state for all of us here, right? You guys are the biggest, you got the, the import of these animals started there, right? And, and, and so they've been established here longer possibly than anywhere else in the USA. And, if we lose a big state like Florida to these animals not being allowed to be kept, then it's only just going to start a tidal wave that's going to ban them all over the USA. So we got to stand behind making sure that Florida, you know, gets all the help that they can in order to, to protect the, our, you know, our wanting to keep these animals or our wanting to work with these animals, you know? So yeah, man, anything that we can do to support, be more vocal, advocate, like you said, be more educational, stop being so sensational. Uh, and just, you know, put out animal content that's actually there to help people and not just to, like, show off, oh, look how scary these animals are, you know? Um, yeah, man. And like I said, I 100% I agree that the SSEC needs to do something about training with these people because all this stuff could have been avoided and it could have been handled in a way better situation than it is now, you know? For sure, man. For sure, you know? All right, so we're going to um, now get into the, you know, the the my the podcast and what I you know when I bring in my guests what I want to talk about um you know Eddie you are currently working with blue tree monitors right um you know me man yeah yeah do do a quick introduction of what uh if you work with any other species you know your full name and where you're from cool man my name is Eddie aka Father Blue but everyone my real name is Eduardo but uh I'm from Washington, D.C., born and raised there, but I live in New York City, Brooklyn, New York, uh, and I work with Blue Tree Monitors. I have at the moment the largest public group of adult Blue Tree Monitors uh, in captivity. Uh, I have a 4.4 uh, group, so it's four females, four males, uh, and I am dedicated and passionate to working with these animals educationally, uh, 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 you know, kind of like to spread the word out and everything like that, conservation, everything like that about these animals. So, um, yeah, man, that's kind of what I'm doing here. You know, like my whole passion for this entire project is just bring more awareness to the Blue Tree Monitor, uh, share my passion for them, kind of be like, kind of like a role model and a resource for everybody that wants to learn about these animals, 
uh, just so that, you know, we can do things the right way uh, when keeping these animals. I'm going further in terms of like also trying to start like these large, and we'll probably talk about this more, so, you know, starting like the foundation to have a large uh, reproductive group here that can withstand the possibility of these things going extinct, you know, in the wild and stuff like that. So a lot of little small projects with a big project in mind. Uh, but yeah, that's me, Eddie, behind the name behind Father Blue. For sure. Thanks. Thanks for the intro, Eddie. Um, so let me ask you, do you work with any other species currently or just blue tree monitors right now? At the moment, only blue tree monitors. I've worked with different monitor species in the past. Like I've worked with uh, Australian black-headed monitors. I've worked with savannah monitors. I've worked with boas. I've worked with iguanas. I've worked with many animals in the past. Uh, but in recent years, I would say like, uh, I think like three or so years, I've been working exclusively with the blue tree monitor. It's an animal that I've just been so passionate about. And when I got into them, they were a lot rarer than they are now. And they're still rare now, but they weren't as like in high demand as they are now. And I just fell in love with them. And I, I just really decided to like, you know, kind of like what people say, like niching down on one species of animal. Like I mm -hmm. wanted something that was like easy to like, I can figure out the ins and outs entirely of how to take care of these. Uh, and that way, if I want to get more, it's like a simple like plug and play kind of playbook to how to take care of these versus having like a hundred different animals with different care requirements and everything like that, you know? Yeah. So, so Matthew, right now, are I'm your, yeah. Models. Okay. And, and are your animals and, you know, because I'm pretty new to blue tree monitors, um, you know, your page is the, you know, your Instagram, your social media is what I've, my blue tree monitor content and information, a lot of it is coming from your, your social media. Um, I did go on Google and try to, you know, try to familiarize, familiarize myself where they're from and stuff like that, because um, I've, I've only really dealt with Western hog noses. Uh, I'm pretty new into the, um, reptile world of what's currently the reptile community and world um i had i grew up in jersey um and then so when i grew up in uh what's it called in like middle school high school i used to have uh iguanas and turtles uh in yeah, jersey yeah, yeah. and stuff like that um once i left to the military and stuff like that i uh let one of my friends that also had uh iguanas have the animals and then um never thought about getting back into them until recently was the western hog noses um and then we got a, a Kenyan sambal in this enclosure here. And then we have a, um, what's it called, a bearded dragon in our living room in a, a large enclosure out there. Um, but, you know, so blue tree monitors, when I saw your monitors, it really caught my eye, you know, that blue on them. Yeah, man. It's not the actual <laughs> skin color, right? It's the scales or something like that that make it look blue. Well, can you explain yeah, that to us? It's it's the it's the you know so they're they're they have different there it's a correlation of different colors so their base color is actually black with blue mm -hmm. scalation blue and white scalation all over them and there's some cases of them coming in as with green scalation as well uh, but no they are an actual blue lizard there's no like they're not there's not they're not do they're not like chameleons where they're changing colors from like black to blue or anything like that they're mm -hmm. fully blue animal at all times so that's what drew me into them as well you know like. One thing is my favorite color is blue, uh, but they, that had nothing to do with me wanting to get them. I, I worked, I, was, I wanted to work with the blue tree monitors because I wanted something that was a little bit bigger than the black headed monitors that I was working with, but not as big as the Savannah. Uh, and when I was doing research on tree monitors, the blue tree monitors were the biggest out of all of them, which is what drew me towards them. I wanted something that was a little bit bigger than the standard green tree. I started off with blues. I had a green tree. I saw the noticeable difference. I didn't, I, I, you know, I, I rehomed my green trees and then I, I just worked strictly with the blues uh, from there. But no, they're, they're beautifully rare animal. Uh, and like you said, man, the, that color draws so many people in because when you think about like how many animals in the animal kingdom come out naturally blue, they're so yeah. very few. It's a rare coloration that when you see it in person, it's just stunning to be quite honest, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man. And like, you know, not even, I don't know any other species that even in like, genetic mutation, you know, the morphs that we call them, have been able to get anything close to, you know, the natural blues that, you know, like yeah, these, the yeah. blue tree monitors or certain frogs um, and certain like snake species that are naturally blue. Um, right. Know, so I think they're, they're, they're really, you know, um, which is a stunning animal and stuff like that. 
And then what you're doing with their husbandry, you know, the cages are right behind you, the enclosures are right behind you. You know, you're taking to the next level, man. Um, I, I think what you're doing, especially with these monitors, and you can tell from your videos and stuff like that, that they are, you know, uh, smart animals and, and they are active. And, and you know, like I said, I went and did my homework and I watched a lot of your um, Instagram stuff. I watched uh, some of your YouTube as well. And you can tell that these animals are using multiple areas of your the, the enclosure that you have built for them. 100%, you know, so it's man, not, 100%. It's not just an open space and they're staying in one little corner. You know, they're actually no. using multiple areas. I mean, you think about how they're found in the wild. You know, they're, they're, they're in trees with canopies. They're like hundreds of feet in the air, you know? Like they're in like a wild space, you know? And like yeah. for, for tree monitors especially, they're, they're traveling in like three different axes, up, down, left, right, everywhere, you know? And so they're, 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 they got it in their name. They're tree, they're tree monitors. They're arboreal creatures. Mm -hmm. So they need the space, you know, you would imagine. And for so long when I got into this, man, I, and the reason why I do this is when I got into this, when the, the, the information available at the time was that people were just in the U.S. And I will say this about U.S. keepers, uh, and it's not everyone. I'm not talking about anybody in particular, just in general. A lot of the information being spread out was here's a bare minimum of what you need to keep tree monitors, right? And it was only coming from people that kept, that were breeding them specifically, but they were keeping them in like four foot by four by two foot cages. And you would ask them like, why don't you keep them in the big cages with the natural plants and the trees and this and that? And every single time they would be like, because we can't keep the heat correct. Because we can't give them, they, they won't go to the bottom. I only give them this much because they always, they always stay in the same spot. They never go to the bottom. And I'm like, how do you make the assumption that they're not going to the bottom? Have you tried? And nine times out of ten, the guys are like, no, I never tried. So I don't do it. And I'm like, okay, so you don't know if they'll utilize it. Or, and then they'll say like, oh, I can't keep it hot enough. I'm like, you just haven't tried. I mean, I experimented. I figured out a way to heat the bottom of my closure. And you can see my videos. My animals use every single inch of my cage. If I'm built it bigger, they will use every single inch of the cage. And I said this the other day, I was on another live. And they were the, another thing is people were like, we don't keep them in the big cages because they don't breed in big cages. Well, I have a video now for the past five days. I've had my tree monitors breeding constantly in these giant cages. So again, it's a lot of this like excuse making of like older generation and, and, and more so what's that word? It's like um, folklore, like folk uh, husbandry, right? Of like you just passing down this old information and saying it works when no one's tried to do it differently to see if we're, we're doing it wrong, right? So that's where I come in with trying to innovate and try to do things differently and sharing my, my sharing what I'm happening. The biggest thing, the reason why I started Father Blue was so that I can document and share every single thing that I learned about these animals so that people like you can see it and don't have to deal with all the failures I did or, or the next generation can see it and don't have to deal with the same failures, you know? So, yeah, man. Sorry to go on a little tangent right there. Dude. I get super excited. No, man. That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's, <laughs> and, and that's what, you know, I want to bring people like you that are, are passionate about the uh, animals you're keeping. And then I also agree. You said something earlier too, like you or you want to, you got rehomed your green tree monitors and you had other stuff, but when you saw the blues, you decided you wanted to concentrate on that, you know, animal and learn everything about it. And I feel the same way about the Western hog noses. You know, I, I, I um, if, I, you know, if, if I was able to, and all I had to do was, you know, be in a reptile room and had, you know, the infinite space, I would probably have, you know, every, you know, type of species of reptile, because I think every reptile, yeah. It's amazing, you know. They're so unique same, about same, each other, but yeah. them. But the reality is, there's no way I'll be able to, spell, especially starting off, is to take care of multiple species on a larger scale. If I have one, maybe like I have one uh, Kenyan sambo, I have one bearded dragon, but majority yeah, yeah, yeah. of my time goes to my Western hog noses, you yeah. know. Um, so I know if if I want to start another project with breeding or any of that stuff, I wouldn't have the time an effort to put into a hundred percent and then that those animals would be, you know, I will still try to keep and maintain them as best possible, but they would not probably get as much attention as I would, or I wouldn't be able to, unless I was doing yeah. this 24 hours a day. Right. Yeah, um, and exactly. then I also am a firm believer of specialize in one thing. 
You know, in, in any facet of your life, I think, you know, if you specialize, you start specializing in one thing. Once you get really good at that stuff, then you do something else. You know, yeah, but yeah, if you're trying exactly. to do five things at once, you'll never you know, be like, good at any of them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the cliche, you know, jack of all, all trades, master of none, you know? Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's why I, 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 I got to give that train of thought back to like my military uh, time frame. Like the Marines were so good, especially in like in, in um, I did infantry. So we, I did combat. Um, the, what differentiates the Marines from like the Army and um, like the Navy and stuff like that, especially from the Army, because they're the other like, you know, ground to ground combat um, um, armed forces is that the Army infantry most of them get um a generalized a training for different uh facets of the combat job where in the marine corps um you get broken down into uh different like i was a um infantryman so infantryman you know i was infantry and infantryman and infantry it's um the guys that actually do the the you know go into a house do the raids do the searches deal with the people to people right then you have your machine gunners that that's what they do. They learn in and out the machine gun. Then you have your mortar men and it, it just breaks down in every facet like that. And that's right. why the Marine Corps has become such a, like a, uh, a well, uh, uh, such a good fighting machine because everybody's specialized right. in their, um, you know, in their field of infantry and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, if you play that, that mindset and anything you're doing, You'll definitely get ahead and you know put the time into it yeah. i agree man there's so many animals here that i want man if i could i'd fill this room up with every single modern species in the world you know but then i wouldn't give these guys that much attention i probably wouldn't be successful right now with keeping these guys and then i have to spend every day learning about those animals and not learning about these as much as i am every day so i completely agree with that man and if i recommend it to anybody getting into animal if you did get into it I know there's like a, a, a wave or there's a love for like, you know, join the route of like, no disrespect to these guys, like pet tubers and the guys that have like a hundred different animals in their room. That's all fun. That's all fun and everything like that. But I think you'd be more rewarded if you focus on one species, learn the in and out of those, make sure that you can dive into their like husbandry as perfect as you can. And when you say, like you said, when you master that animal and you're never going to master, it, but when you got a good foundation, move on to the next one if you, if you really so have to or want to, you know? For sure, man. For sure, yeah. And you know what's the thing? We know so little about reptiles. And, and, and you know, most animals. Most animals, you know. We've, we, know we know a lot more about uh, dogs and cats because they've been domesticated for so long, you know, and they're the major types of uh, pets that people keep. Um, but any other animal out of that realm, we know so little about them and how to properly not just keep them, but properly um, give them medical attention. You know, right. I, I feel like 100%. The, the, the time if I have to go to the vet or like, you know, when I've heard um, my friends have been in, especially Western Hognos have been in for years, the time they've gone to the vet, it's almost like a wild crapshoot to see if the vet is really going to know what he's talking about. And hopefully 100%. he does and he gets you good treatment. You know, uh, but most of the, most of the time, uh, it's I think it's like a 50 50 chance. Um, and it's not, not to their fault. It's not their fault. It's just there's not enough. You know, um, yeah, I, I mentioned this. I've mentioned this, I think, maybe in multiple of my lives and, and content I do. Um, if, you know, people say, oh, you know, there's certain parts of the reptile, uh, certain species are oversaturated. We're overbreeding and stuff like that. But imagine if every person in this country or in the world that has a dog or a cat had also a reptile, there wouldn't be enough. There wouldn't Good be point. enough animals to, to sell. You know, there wouldn't be enough Good breeding to, to go around. Um, but it's our job, people that are, you know, that are willing to be in front of you know, the media and try to put the, our names out there and our animals to educate and maybe spark that interest in somebody that's willing to pick up a snake or uh you know some kind of reptile or even any other exotic animal right um and then just like just like cats and dogs not everybody needs to own a pet you know? yeah I because agree, dude. you, I you, agree you see how many dogs and cats are in shelters too you know? yeah 
Yeah. Yeah, hundred percent, man. There's a lot of people that shouldn't own a lot of animals. I don't know if you ever heard the story of the guy here in New York City that owned a tiger in the project building. They found a tiger, no. a full grown tiger and an alligator in the project building, dude. So yeah. There's a lot of people Bro. in America like that that they shouldn't own animals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In, in an eight hundred square foot of, you know, freaking apartment, you know, you have a tiger yeah, in, a, in a tiger. the <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he only got he only got found because he went to the hospital and he had a bite. And he told the doctor he got bit by a dog, and the doctor was like, "That's not a dog bite. What the fuck was that?" Yeah. <laughs> That's only reason he got caught. Yeah, man. It's crazy, yeah. man. Yeah, yeah. and, and the, like stories like that, there's probably hundreds and thousands of that currently going on, right? Um, 100%, and like I said, man, one hundred percent. Those people are gonna be are are the ones that get brought up to that limelight, and then you know that that's what yeah, the I don't know these people start running with trying to create laws and all this other stuff with that. I don't know if you heard of this, man. Last month, they found an alligator here in Brooklyn in Prospect Park. It's one of our big parks in Brooklyn. They found an alligator in the park, dude. It was almost died. It was emaciated. It was almost dead. But someone came and dumped an alligator in the park. And I'm like, that's crazy. And then a week later, they found a 14-foot reticulated python dead in, in, a, in a, a Long Island, just on the, on the, on the side of the road. 14 foot reticulated, and that's banned here in New, in New York. In New York, you're not allowed to own that. But they found that. Really? So, like, you see these people doing this sort of stuff, and luckily, like, you know, nothing has been said yet, right? But you know, it's 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 only a matter of time. Like, a lot of the animals here in New York City are banned. Like, yeah, there's so many things you can't keep in New York City mm -hmm. at the moment because of these type of scares and everything like that. And it's like, like I said, man, if, if we keep on going this route, we're gonna end up with every state being banning animals and everything like that. Not to go back into that tangent but yeah you know like yeah it's scary man no we, we need to be responsible for the animals that's that's point blank right like if if you don't think um that you can long-term keep these animals or properly give them care just don't get them you know right. be right. real right. with yourself right. and don't get them you know uh, that, that's any the, kind of animal you know yeah that's the thing i say with the blue tree monitors and the tree monitors in general man i know a lot of people are, you know, these animals are getting so popular right now, right? Because you see them online. You see like people like a Dion from Rotiliatus showing his animals walking around and you see these animals online and they look so amazing, right? You see this little slender little tree monitor walking up your arm, eating food from your hand. It's such a beautiful thing to see. But the reality of the situation is, man, these animals need a lot of work and space. I mean, for example, look at what I'm keeping my animals in. Who, like and not a lot of people have the luxury of being able to keep a six foot tall or seven foot tall, four foot by three. That's a big cage, right? That's a big cage in a, in, in a home. And I don't think a lot of people realize that coming into these animals, they just see like, oh, it's a beautiful animal. And, and I'm going to be able to, you know, put it on my shoulder and this and that. They don't take into account that they need varied diets or high humidity or, 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 or super constant heat or and all these little, you know, nitpick kind of mm -hmm. parameters to keep them healthy. Um, and so I always tell people that like, they're beautiful animals. If you can afford to take care of them, if you can afford to take care of them because they're expensive, by all means go and I'll help you. I'll tell you anything you need to know, any type of information you need, I'm willing to help you. But don't think that you're gonna get a tree monitor and you're gonna treat it like an Aki and it's gonna be fine. You know, like it's just, you know, I'm an advocate for, yeah. for good husbandry in any single way, especially when it comes to tree monitors, because I'm passionate as hell about that, you know. Yeah. And you know what, man? You, you brought up a good, you know, um, point about having space, right? Um, and and you're, you're in New York, so you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. You know, we're having a crisis. There's, there's Ooh, a, a, a home availability, the space of, of what people are living on in. It's getting smaller and smaller, and people are divvying out, you know, homes and renting out rooms and or making just cutting basically sometimes cutting an apartment in half and making two right. um you know studios and stuff like that you know so like that that's another thing to think about that like where are we going to be eventually as a, a, a community in you know especially in the u.s with the weight amount the amount of that we are building or the amount of people that we have you know right um you you are you have the luxury to keep those cages especially in new york right you know? right and, and you're and you're very lucky to to have that um i know you know you know I, I don't i don't know your your background i know you do a little bit of um 3d printing and stuff like that but um not to get too personal to like your you know your um finance and stuff like that but what
for for work that allows you to you know maintain these animals at the upkeep because it's got to be expensive to, to be able to build these cages to feed them and maintain them at the level you do yeah it's expensive man i'm not gonna lie it costs mm. it probably costs me about like two to three hundred dollars you know a month to take care of them that's with like electricity food uh, and all the resources that are put into them and everything like that, right? That's, that's a lot. That's a lot. That's like sometimes for some people, a w one week's pay, right? Just to take care of them. But um, I, I was lucky to make, you know, a couple good investments. So I have a good enough, like, you know, savings and everything like that. In that sense, I have the 3D printing business that I've started that's like taken off pretty well and everything like that for the animals. But before that, I've also done 3D printing uh, production and prototyping for clients and everything like that. That's my own kind of business that I run in that stuff. So I have my, my fleet of 3D printers that are doing that, designing and modeling. That brings in a good chunk of money as well. Um, and then I'm also, I also do a, a contract workout for people here in New York City, uh, being kind of like a technical, it's a technical director of service. So pretty much is like, I, I help run service departments and make sure that they are as profitable as they can be. I get contracted out by a company, they're like, hey, how can you help us bring in more revenue to the service center? Uh, what can we do out? Can we build it out this way and everything like that? And I help them do that sort of stuff. So just making some good choices, being lucky in some opportunities and things like that, managing my funds a little bit well, you know, and things like that, breeding bugs and stuff so I can save some money here and there when taking care of the animals. But just dipping my hands in a lot of different things, man, in order to be able to afford this, you know? Because like you said, man, I am very blessed. I am very lucky to be able to have the space, the time, the resources and everything like that to do that. And not a lot of people are in a position like me to yeah. take care of this many rare animals and have this space and everything like that. So I am yeah. blessed, you know, for sure to be in this. But I didn't start off with like uh, rich parents or anything like that, man. You know, I come from I come from a, a, a mom that, you know, immigrated over here and a dad that immigrated here as well to the U.S. and started off in public schools and, you know, didn't have like a, 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 the best upbringing. You know, I just worked really hard since I was 18 years old and yeah, I'm 30 years old now, you know, and I just, I, you know, everything's going well right now, which is cool. It's good, man. Yeah. You see, and this is, this is what I really want my podcast to be in like, you know, having a success story and, and showing that hard work does get you somewhere, right? If, if you put in the dedication, yeah, and the work you you could get somewhere and reach your goals and you know um, enjoy the things you want right you're able because you're hard work you're able to enjoy these blue tree monitors and stuff yeah hundred um, percent and and one one other one another thing too that it's not just monetary but the most valuable thing that we have and we always forget it's our time you know <laughs> um, Tell me about that, yeah. because man time we can't get it back right and then if you don't have the availability to you know um, work for yourself or like uh you know um or have a job that you don't have to be there eight ten hours a day plus commute plus do other stuff um where, where there's no time to maintain these animals right right um, right and, and and i don't think that's another thing people don't take into consideration when they get uh certain animals it's like okay i have the money to you know buy the animal make care take care of it but do I have the time to actually put the work in it? You know? Right, right. You know, exactly, I think that's something exactly. that some people need to really think about. It takes a lot of time. You got to get up early. Like even when I do my, you know, contract work and everything like that, if I got a, a week that I'm working, I got to get up two hours earlier than I got to start so I can come home down here, feed my animals, water my animals, take care after a long day of work, still come back here and give these animals the time they need to make sure they're taken care of. You know, it's not like yeah. I could just have them have everything automated and they're fine. No, dude, they take a lot of work after that. You know, like yeah. I've missed out on so many trips. I've missed out on so many like, you know, events and everything like that, that I could have gone to because I sacrificed that time to give it to the animals. And that's sort of the dedication you got to get in. You got to give when you work with this sort of stuff, you know? hundred percent. Yeah. You know, you, you said you sacrifice, you know, events, trips and stuff like that. I'm in the same boat, right? Uh, my uh, my wife, and my daughters are going to New York. It's my wife's um, her grandfather's uh, I think 70th birthday or something like that. Um, so oh, they're wow. going to New York um, in the end of May. But May for me is my female should be dropping eggs and stuff like that, you know. Oh, man, so dude. I can't go. 
you know, like I have to be here because there's nobody that I can, yeah. you know, tell me, hey, you know, go do this, right? So I have to yeah, stay yeah, here for yeah. that trip and stuff like that. But that's part of it, right? I, I want to have these animals. I want to breed them. I got to make the sacrifice. You know. exactly exactly man exactly yeah i got i got a couple of trips that i'm going to myself man but luckily i'm blessed with a partner that really supports me and everything like that so she's gonna help me out um but in september i'm gonna be in uh i don't know if you've heard or if i in any of the other podcasts i'm doing but i'm going to indonesia to batanta the island the only island that you can find blue tree monitors i'm going to the island uh two weeks on the island one week in indonesia uh to investigate and re- document how these animals are laying in the wild, you know, kind of similar to my whole background with the, the nest bins and stuff that I've been making. I'm going mm-hmm. out there to kind of prove the theory that are they laying in, in termite mounds or are they laying in, in hollow logs or are they laying in the dirt, whatever it is. I'm going in the time of the year when there should be laying eggs or lay, eggs have been laid to go figure this out and everything like that. But I'm going down with a with um, the, the, the original guide that was there when they first documented the blue tree monitor in the wild uh, and or for scientifically. Uh, and so it's going to be a crazy trip, man. Crazy trip. Two, 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 year, two weeks in the jungle just watching and documenting a blue tree monitor, man. It's going to be crazy, man. Nice, man. That's, that seems like a, a trip of a lifetime, man. And yeah, I'm man. happy you're able to do that, man. That's, that's pretty, yeah. pretty, pretty cool. Um, and yeah, it's, man it shows how dedicated you are to these animals. You know, you could have taken the trip yeah. anywhere else in the world, right? Yeah. Right. When you're going to go <laughs> stick yourself, you know, in the middle of the jungle and go research these animals and, and watch 100%, them. Stuff like that, man. You know, 100%. but I've never been, I've never flown, yeah. I've never flown anywhere else, but the Dominican Republic. And that's it. I've only been to the Dominican Republic to see family because that's where I'm from, but never been anywhere else. And that's the place I chose to go. <laughs> it's going to be funny though, man. No, I can't imagine, man. Indonesia is a pretty good, pretty uh, amazing country. I've heard from friends that have gone and stuff like that. And they say, like, I've never heard anything bad about, like, the community and the, the country there and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm pretty sure you're going to have a good time, man. Yeah, sure. yeah, I can imagine, man. Are, imagine. are you going to document all this stuff? You know, and, The and, entire and... thing, dude. The entire I'm going to document yeah. the entire – what I'm trying to do is set it up so that I can doc, do a small documentary kind of like – on my work right because like to me this is like my 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 almost like mecca almost right my travel to mecca where like i started here and, I, and i'm working with the tree monitors i've been doing this for three years and i and now i'm breeding the tree monitors and then going over to botanics to see them in the wild bring the entire story for full circle you know and um i'm going to be documenting them in a way that i don't think they've been documented before like we have like there's one gentleman, one of my friends, Chris Applin, was just in Batanza last, like in November. And uh, he recently like photographed them and things like that. But I'm going to really bring in like, you know, a, a, a professional camera to capture them in the wild, make a small documentary, like really bring them to the eye like we've never seen before, hopefully. And just like, just so that I can bring more awareness to these animals, you know, like, these are animals, not only to prove the theories that I have behind how they're like reproducing and how they're laying eggs and everything like that a while, but to bring awareness to like how beautiful these animals are, how rare they are, how in danger they are. You know, they, they've, we've only known about these animals scientifically since 2010, to put that in perspective. There's only 13 yeah. years, 13 years they've been recognized by some and they're already threatened. You know, they're being poached so fast that you know, people are worried that in the next couple of years, 10 years even, we can lose them in the wild, right? And not only that, they're only found on one island in the, you know, in the circle of fire of Indonesia, and all it takes is one volcano, one, one tsunami, one natural, you know, disaster, and we can lose them forever, right? And so to bring this awareness and, 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 and everything like that to these people so that we know what's going on and just like share the love and passion for the animals. That's the entire kind of goal for this trip and everything like that. You know, it falls hand in hand with my projects that I'm doing here as well with the reproduction events and everything like that. And my plans for like captive breeding these animals. So then I, 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 to like, I have a bigger project here in the, in the, in the, in, in my space where I'm trying to reproduce these animals, breed them. And then out of the clutches that I make, I want to donate a portion of my clutches to zoos around the world so that they can have their own breeder groups of baby tree monitors that they can establish and hopefully breed in the future as well. But not just that, to give, to bring awareness and education to their people in their communities and stuff like that, you know? So there's so, there's this whole problem. 
project is just a big passion project to hopefully establish these tree monitors here in captivity so they're here to stay and they don't go extinct. You know, that's kind of like the passion behind this entire thing. Yeah, man, it's, it's, it sounds like you have a whole plan set, man, for this, you know, starting with this trip and then going off of that. Um, uh, Christina from Genetics Nerd, she, um, she had a question. She's asking if you're going to be taking temp, UV, humidity readings for the burrows and stuff, all that stuff. Every single thing. Everything is going to be documented. I want to take soil samples. I want to take soil readings. I want to see what type of how what, what what the light cycles are out there. What's the UV UV index? What's the bio, uh, the, the 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 barometric pressure out there? What's the humidity like throughout the entire day? Like what type of insects they're eating out there? How they're drinking water out there? Because I don't think they're going down to like you know streams. I don't know if we even have streams, but we'll see. You know, like how are they? Are they mostly in the canopies? Do they come down to the ground? Like. There's so many theories that I have behind how these animals are being are, are like fending for themselves in the wild that I just want to document every single thing and answer every single question that there is about these animals to be quite honest, you know. So yeah, I'm gonna have I'm gonna write a book about all the stuff that I find out. I promise you, I'm gonna bring data back that we've never seen before, hopefully. So yeah, fingers crossed for the trip to be like no issues, no hiccups, but that's the plan, yeah. man. Nice, nice man. So Nancy, um what what's with especially with the blue tree monitors because like you said it's only since 2010 they've been you know discovered in, in, in the scientific um you know categories and stuff like that what's the biggest uh hurdle you've had to deal with these animals and stuff like that was like challenges you've had to deal with working with wild caught animals just in general like and that's the pro and then that goes back hand in hand with captive breeding them here to give them more established when I got into my animals, there wasn't a lot of captive bred animals as there are now, right? Like now I can name 10 people that bred them in the past year. When I got into them, there was maybe two or three, right? That was breeding them regularly every year. Um, and dealing with imported animals, they're just so fragile is the best way to say, right? They, they go from the states of like coming in so dehydrated, so frail, uh, and if you don't take care of them correctly, they can they can deteriorate so quickly, so fast. Uh, they're so skittish, so you get these animals that, like, when you come to the window, they're merely scurrying to the ground, hitting their faces on walls and trying to escape you, uh, not wanting to eat, not wanting to drink, you know, being full of parasites, uh, being so skittish that you can't hold them to administer medicine. Like So just dealing with the imports and figuring out how to take care of them. Now I have a routine that I'm, I'm – I've never had a tree monitor, you know, pass on me due to husbandry, right? Like I, I, I've lost one tree monitor in my entire life. Uh, and it was because I was away for a month. My partner at the time didn't know how to take care of them. You know, it, it, we were all new to this and everything like that. It was like really early on. Um, and it, it, you know, it was kind of like, unfortunately, I shouldn't have been gone for so long. They shouldn't have been responsible. And I lost a tree monitor in that manner. But due to my husbandry here, how I've kept them, I've never lost a tree monitor in that sense, right? And so just dealing with that you know and and and, and i said this before when you're dealing with these imported tree monitors you're dealing with an animal that has been so psychologically damaged you know from from being extracted from the wild shipped put into a dark container put into a holding facility going to the dealer then shipped in a box then shipped to you now it's in a new cage it just came from this open free space and now put in a box and it's taking like who knows how long Diane was so frightened and so psychologically damaged, it will never come back to like be a Hannibal animal like you see the guys on YouTube with the tree monitors running up their arms. So just learning how to deal with those animals in that manner has been the hardest thing with them, you know? So I, and I tell everyone, if you get into tree monitors, if there's any single chance of you being able to do it, start with a captive bread. I know it's so easy to get a import the prices are way cheaper i'm telling you you're going to be happier getting a captive bread than you will be dealing with imports in my opinion okay cool now that, that's good good information because like i said people are definitely they're, they're like you said too they're becoming more popular and people are looking to maybe uh, get into them and purchase them and maybe you know starting breeding projects and stuff like that but yeah, yeah. So here the reality of what you know um i think in general right cap uh wild caught animals they're going to go through that shock period because it's their, their mental, you know, 
health de degrades, their um, physical health degrades, and you yeah. have to be that per you have to, you know, get them back up to, um, it's hard to say that you'll ever get them back to that 100% they were in the wild, but enough to where right. they can thrive in captivity, right? And then you can work with them. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, like the ones that's, behind that's me, the ones I've been breeding recently, the ones that have been breeding recently, they were wild caught, right? But they're captive now five or six years in captivity. And now those animals working with them, I can hold them. I can give them food. They eat from my hands. They're not afraid of me. They don't run around and bang against the wall. But they're, that's six years of them seeing people and being around in captivity to be comfortable like that versus a year with an imported animal. Like I know I've had animals that have had for two years that still run and, and bash into the walls when they see me come near them, right? And I can't feed them from the tongue or anything like that. So yeah, it's, it's just, you know, they're all different in that sense, but it takes a lot of time, a lot of work, a lot of effort to get those animals to that, to that state. And not all of them will go to that state of being comfortable with you. Some will, they're all individuals just like us, you know? Yeah. 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 So I'm guessing, I'm guessing you have, you know, one side of the spectrum where, you know, you have probably that one that's super friendly with you you know, maybe comes up to the to the uh, the glass when you walk by the enclosure, and you probably have that one that is comfortable with you, but still watches you. You know, to what you do, right? Hundred um, percent. Yeah, know. yeah, yeah. And, and you know, uh, realizing that and not pushing yourself on that one that's you know a little bit more standoffish offish is very important too, right? Um, knowing right. every individual animal. Um, one time, I was funny. I was telling my my wife one day. Um, I was at work and I told him, hey, I got to, um, I, I defrosted uh, uh, mice to feed this, this one animal. Um, he was in my quarantine rack in the, in, the, in the other office that we had in the house. I go, but there's a specific way you got to feed him or he won't eat, you know? Um, and she goes, what? Why? I go, he's just, he's just not comfortable enough. You know, and she, we had to yeah. turn his hide upside down, basically like cover, give him a little bit of shadow and then put the mice in there. Where it wasn't like yeah. overshadowing him and stuff like that. Um, yeah, exactly. And my wife's like, man, this this snake is bougie. I was like, he's just not comfortable <laughs> right now, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah. They're all but, different. But if, They're all different. Yeah, if you didn't take the time, if I didn't take the time to realize that, then it would have been like shoving that mice in his face every time. And maybe he wouldn't have made it out of quarantine period, uh, out of right. quarantine. And maybe, you know, have, wouldn't have finished eating, wouldn't have um, ate correctly. And stuff like that, but yeah. you gotta catch on to those little nuances that these animals do show you. Agreed, agreed, yeah. man. Yeah. So, uh, Christina had another good question. She says, Um, if you had uh, to tell anybody, was it Eddie, what's one thing you would want other people to know about these animals? You got three minute clip to explain why they captivated you. <laughs> I think I kind of explained it, but I'll go again. It's just they're yeah. an animal that's just so unique to this world, right? And 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 again, there's probably, there's many animals like that, right? But these are the animals that, that chose to captivate me. They're just a very unique, individualized and intelligent animal. They're so smart in the way that they learn and react to people, the way that they move their mannerisms, the way that you study them and the things that you see with them are just so amazing. The fact that you put them in that they're from such a remote, localized area like Batan to this small, tiny island off the coast of Batan, off the coast of, of Papua New Guinea, where the only place in the world to see these blue lizards, that's also captivating. Then you get the fact that they're, they're monitor lizards, so they're just so intelligent. They're one of the only monitor lizards with prehensile tails. So they're able to fully control their tails to hang onto branches and they're arboreal. All these in the mix come up with an animal that's just an apex predator in where it's, you know, in its, in its environment, right? And it's just a, a beautiful thing to see and witness it to these animals just living life. Everything from the way that they look at you when you come into the enclosure, the way that they eat food, the way that they learn how to, like, if one animal learns how to escape, it'll keep escaping that same way until I fix it because it learned that's how to get out, you know, or, or when it learns, oh, this is how I eat my food. Okay, I have these feeder cups I put it in, my food's there. Oh, I know my food's there. I'm going to expect that my food's there. Now, I learned that it's food there. Or the other day when I was trying to give one of my animals medicine, it learned what the medicine smelled like and stop eating that food because it didn't want the taste of it. Like it learned that, like to know that these animals are smart enough in their cognitive behavior to learn that type of stuff is just an amazing thing, man. And then you get a, you know, an animal that's just so 
unique, you know, the blueness of these animals. I've never seen an animal that's come out that blue and this and, and so big and so lanky and, and just, man, I just honestly, I just, I, I get so excited speaking about these animals because it's just so cool to me, man. You know, you think about, you see it, you show a little kid this in the zoo, they're just going to go crazy because they're like little dinosaurs, right? And it's just, it's an amazing thing to work with, man. And, and yeah, I just want people to kind of see that and, and kind of realize how amazingly special these animals are. And if we lose these animals, you know, to whatever it is that has happened, whether it's poaching or, or, or natural disasters or anything like that, it's just something that we'll never, ever be able to see something like this in captivity again. And so I want to do my part to just make sure that they, they're here to stay, man. Honestly, that's it. That's kind that, of where I'm at with it, man. Yeah, I hear that, man. <laughs> um, you know, so success, right? My podcast, Scale Success and stuff like that. And, and, you know, the logo, it's started from the bottom, trying to get to the, you know, working your way all the way to the top. What, what is success to you, either in your, you know, personal life, uh, professionally, and with the reptiles? Like, what do, you, what do you, where do you see yourself maybe in the next five years as, as this success grows? Um, I want to be an advocate for conservation for blue tree monitors in a way that, like, I, I, I plan to dedicate my life to these animals in particular, and monitors in general. Like, I love monitors, so I want to work with those animals. So for the next five years, what would be successful to me is to reproduce these in the, in the, in the, in captivity successfully, knowing like the ins and outs of how to do that so that I can teach these zoological centers how to do it themselves so that they can continue to reproduce these in captivity. Uh, and then to start these breeding programs and educational programs around the world with animals from my offspring so that they just, so that they can then learn how to do it as well and teach other people about these animals. Um, and just get to the point where we have enough blue tree monitors in captivity so that when they stop the importation of them, we'll still have them available and we don't lose them to extension, extra poaching or anything like that. You know, So that's success to me, man. Just getting the word out to be able to help people out so they don't have any issues with working with these animals or anything like that in the future, you know? That's all I really want yeah. from it. Yeah. And you know what, man? Like, I can see that you're so passionate where like, the reptile and your personal goals, you know, like they're one. I can see that they're matched <laughs> up. There's not two separate things right now, you know? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I can see that you're putting a lot of your time and effort into, you know, furthering these uh, these animals in captivity. Because that's, that's the thing, right? Getting them to be uh, thrive in captivity. Because like you said, if for some reason they become extinct in the wild, then you might be, and a handful of other people, I don't know how many other people have, it might be you're the probably the only ones that will have them, right? Right, right. Um, right. If it happened tomorrow, right? Uh, you know, hopefully it doesn't. But if it happened tomorrow, some natural disaster or something like that, then you will have the last bloodlines to be able to repopulate and, and you know keep these animals in captivity. Yeah, I have I have this dream of uh, this goal that I would love to do, and and maybe one day I can I can achieve that goal. But I would love to start a research facility in the United States somewhere, preferably here in New York if I can, uh, but like government funded or whatever assisted, uh, a research facility for monitors, right? So almost like a monitor sanctuary where we have every single species of monitor inside of a, 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 a built up enclosure that mimics our ecosystem as much as we can so that we can provide not only like a research center for zoological graduates and everything like that, people going for zoological degrees and everything like that, but also a way to study medicine for these animals for veterinary practices and everything like that. Because there's not a lot of people in the veterinary field that know how to work with monitors, nor do we know what type of medicines or illnesses they might have. So to give them a space in which they can come in, learn, you know, kind of work under these people that will be, you know, handling this space uh, to just, you know, kind of figure out how these animals work in captivity and everything like that so that we can then spread the information out to different places around the world, you know. So that's another big pipe dream of mine. Who knows, man? I've already made one dream happen here, which is to start this whole thing. So let's see if we can maybe get that one to go one day, you know? For sure, man. I, I think I think you, you could, man. I think with the motivation, hard work you put it in, if you keep going, I think you get you can accomplish all these things you want to do for these animals in the monitor, <laughs> in the monitor world and stuff like that, man. Um, do you have like a person in the reptile community or within the monitor community that you look up to that maybe has helped you with you know, your monitors and have given you information and knowledge about them? Uh, man, you know, I, I wish I could say I had a mentor 
in this space, a lot of this stuff was like self. I'm not going to say I learned it all myself because I didn't. Right. I, I, I was on, I've been on the Facebook forums. I've been on the fauna classified forums. I've been all over the Internet talking with people all over the world about how to take care of these things. I have friends in Australia. I have friends in Sweden, Germany, Japan, all over the world who deal with tree monitors. So it's like a conglomerate of people's information here and there. In terms of one person, I don't, you know, I've had in the past um, and due to like differences in, 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 in how we like, you know, mutual respect, we just don't, you know, I'll be honest with you, man, the tree monitor community, what you see online with what I do and the reason why I do it is to, is to kind of like fix what I had going into it, which was a lot of gatekeeping, a lot of like, you're not going to be doing this in a couple of years. You're, you'll see like, you're just a young kid type thing. Yeah. A lot of like mm -hmm. doubting in that community. Uh, I got a lot of like, just like negative pushback from a lot of people. Like even when I was building my cages, people didn't like that I was building the cages because they're like, you're doing it wrong and you're just a novice and you don't know what you're doing. And, and things like that, you know, like, or like, you'll never breed them. And things, like, I, I, I I, I don't want to say like I was welcomed originally and I've talked about this in, in, in other places. It was, it's just, it's a weird space, man. The tree monitor community is a weird space because there's such a rare expensive animal. There's a lot of people that want to be like top dog in terms of like breeding them and selling them and things like that. So it yeah. just makes for an overall weird space in that field. And a lot of people don't want to share that information because if you share them, well, then you're a potential competitor in that market for them. Right. So, yeah, a lot of this stuff I had to piece together to learn different aspects from here and there, you know. I'll say shout out to my dude, Brian from Sundown, uh, Brian Susan from Sundown, because he's been a player in this, helping me out with answering questions, and I help him too out wherever I can with different things. Um, Kai Fan is a cool dude, you know, we're friends. He, he always tries to give me, like, advice on things like that, on how to take care of my animals and things like that. Um, I have homie Nicholas, who's in a, he's in Sweden, beautiful dude, probably one of the top breeders over there of tree monitors. Like that guy has like 10, 10 clutches of tree monitors waiting to be incubated right now. So like, again, there's different people from all over the world that's helped me out to get to this point for sure though. Oh yeah, that's great. That's good. And then like, so what about your, your personal life? Because this has to, you know, your, your hard work and your passion has to come from somebody that maybe, um, you know, or that gave you that that fire within you you know is that do you have somebody that a family member or or somebody that you knew uh dude i wish man like i i, I, really? I have a small family right i have a small yeah. family i have a single like a single mom uh like my, my my pops wasn't in the in the family or anything like that too much or anything like that growing up and i've been on my own since like you know 18 at, at 18 i moved out of my crib kind of got like kicked out of the crib and I had to like just work hard you know it was like one of those things like I grew up in DC and it's, uh, it's, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't get a college degree, you know? So I have like, I don't, I don't got, I didn't have like the best start of this, you know? So I had to like, just work hard off the get go. And I just always been kind of like a hustler, always been like very motivated, very like driven where like, I'm going to do something. I'm going to be the best at it. Right. Like, that's why I, I do what I do with building out service centers and everything like that. Like I, I have, I have certifications and licenses that no one else in my community has in my field because I wanted to be the best at it to get to the point that I'm at. And, and that's just a drive that I always had when I'm pushing stuff like it, and it goes to show with that monitors. Like I wanted to do the best I could give for these animals and show people that this is what you can do. And I'm very transparent with everything I do, you know? So unfortunately I've never had a role model. I've had, bosses that i've seen i'm like okay you're successful this is why you're successful i'll take those notes from that and apply them to my life but never it's someone individually that 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 does that maybe my mom i would say my mom because she had to do everything by herself she had to raise three kids on her own salary you know and i saw her from being a waitress all the way to now you know being in her position in healthcare and working so hard and and buying a house for herself and everything like that. Like, so seeing that drive that she has, has rubbed off on me in a sense. But other than that, I would say there's no other like role models that I have yeah. other than her, you know? Yeah, man. And no, and, and I feel the same way because I had the same, same upbringing, you know, a single mother that did everything for us, you know, my, myself yeah. and my, 
my younger brother. I have a really young brother now. Um, but like, yeah, like seeing, I think a lot of people that have seen a single mother, you know, raise them and push hard to be able to do it. A lot of people are hard workers, man. Um, yeah, I have also seen two people like, you know, um, that come from that uh, type of upbringing where um, maybe there was points of your life and stuff like that where like your parent or your single mother struggled and stuff like that. Um, it's a fire within you that you don't want to be that. Uh, you don't want to yeah, be that. Yeah, 100%. Again, pushing you forward, you know? 100%. Um, I, I see that I, all the time. I totally agree with all you. All the time. Yeah, man. I totally agree with you, you know? And I think that's it's a fine line too because like um, my wife tells me and, and, and I had this conversation where the last couple, like last, two weeks ago, um, she says, you try to take on too much at once because you try to like <laughs> keep going on, you know, like keep doing more and more to further yourself. But eventually you burn yourself out on stuff like that. Is, is there, have, have you gotten to a point and stuff like that? I mean, you're still in the reptile in the, you're still dealing with the blue monitors, but have you gotten to a point where like, man, I maybe I bit a little bit too much, you know, maybe I'm overextending myself. All the time, man. All the time. You should have saw me trying to build this shit out in like a month, man. Like I, I got that. We, we just moved to this place in January. So I had a month to build these things out, to get the animals in and that, that entire part and doing it all by myself. And I was just like working and then working, you know, uh, uh, 40 hours a week. They come in on my days off to work on this stuff. Like it was like, it was crazy. dude. There was multiple times where I'm like, I'm buying way too much off that too or working with these for the past three years and I've never had a successful clutch from these animals. So seeing that be put in my face every single day and then I'm seeing everyone online breeding tree monitors and it's their first year getting them and they're getting lucky. And I'm like, what the fuck am I doing with these animals? You know, and I'm just every day getting punched in the face that way or, or, or like, you know, like this animal I'm wanting to eat and it's not eating for a week and I got to figure out how to get it to eat and all this stuff. Like, Every day I'm like, dude, oh my God, I'm pushing more than I'm biting more than I can chew. And then, and then there's a time where like, I see these animals acting the way that they would in the wild, like exploring the cages and, and, and displaying the behaviors I've never seen before, or being lucky enough to reap to get them to breed. Like I've had in the past, like, like that's the light at the end of the tunnel. That's why it's worth it. When you see that stuff or getting people to ask me like, Hey, dude, how do I take care of this? Because I love your videos and you're so, you know, entertaining and you're so knowledgeable. What can I do this and that? Like getting those people or like getting fans from all over the world. They're like, yo, dude, I see your content. It's amazing. Keep it up. Like that's what makes me, pushes me to keep on doing this stuff, man. Because like I got a voice and people want to hear it at the moment, you know? Yeah, man. You know what, man? When when you when you get those messages and, um, you know, when people – recommend your content or your page and stuff like that it is a validation into like all right i'm doing the right thing with my animals right um you know and, and sometimes we're humans and we do need that like you know like i i know that i'm doing the right thing with animals i take care of them. i'm in here a lot um i don't have that many right now but even with the time the the amount that i have i'm in here in this room a lot you know and it's just yeah, um, yeah, to yeah. Point where it, it, it's an, it's, an, it's an obsession, right? Um, to make sure these animals are doing great. Like I have uh, one fe one or two females, one female for sure that's gravid. Um, and then, um, so then I had, I, I was like, okay, I got to get the lay bins in, these, um, in here before, you know, I miss any eggs and stuff like that. And um, it's just like, once I saw that, I knew I had to go do it. And then it was, I put the lay bins last night and then this earliest morning, I'm in here. Okay, let me see if they're using them. Let me see if they're burrowing into the lay bin and stuff. You know, um, before I had to go do my day. my regular job. Yeah, man. <laughs> and I think people that really love these animals have that obsession, that passion about it, right? Um, you know, I think there are those people probably that just buy the animal out of a whim, maybe want a pet, decide to want it, or there may be that person that just it's just a monetary gain for them. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and I think if it's just a monetary gain for you uh, or for a person, um, you're not going to get far within it because you're not going to have that uh, detail, that passion that's going to help that animal keep thriving and be able to, you know, produce and stuff like that. Like you're saying, um, if you get viable eggs this year, it's probably going to be like, the best thing that's ever happened to you this year, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 100%, dude. Yeah. 
I'm gonna go to what? the moon, man. Once I get the eggs this year. Yeah, yeah. What's what's the um? They they lay eggs, right? Or what's the incubation time period for them? Ooh, 140 days is average. With uh, with someone just had a clutch that went for 188. So yes, <laughs> that's a lot oh of time. Oh my to fuck god! Up, yeah. <laughs> Damn. That's a lot of time to mess up, dude. Yeah, because. Th- th- you know, you said you've, you've had these animals for three years. You said most of them for three years, right? Yeah. Getting those eggs and then having to wait another hundred plus days to <laughs> make sure that, you know, they're going to hatch and they're going to be good, you know, viable animals to, to, you know, to raise and stuff like that. Yeah. This is definitely. Yeah. I, I, but then that makes it so much more rewarding too, right? I agree, man. I agree. I can't wait yeah. to see these little babies just walking around, man. I'm going to keep I, – I, I, I promise a friend of mine that he's going to get one, but the rest I'm keeping for myself, man. I'm not going to even let any of them go. I just want to have little babies to raise up and just be a little tree monitor dad, bro. Honestly. Oh, yeah. That's great, man. That's great, yeah. Hell, yeah. Um, let me see. We got what? We're in – an hour and 30 already, man. You know, we're, we're – it's, it's when we're when you're when we're talking about these animals, time flies. Every time I have the, I've done a podcast or I'm watching a podcast, I look at time like, damn, it's already been an hour in. And it's like <laughs> right? we've just scratched the, the surface of what we're going to talk about. I, I feel like so many podcasts can run five, six hours, and we'll Easy. keep talking and Easy. things coming up, you know. Um, but I do want to start getting wrapped, wrapping it up a little bit here and there. Um, if if, if you had a million dollars today, what what would you change with these animals? What would you do different? What would I do differently? Oh man, I would, I, I've already thought about this already, what I want to do. I want to grow, I want to have a crazy real life slice of potenza in the sense that like, I, first off, I would use a portion of that money to fly out there and see every single parameter that i can figure out about that island i will figure it out right i'll spend like a month two months even just figuring that all out then i'll come back here and i would give them like a 30 by 30 square foot space with a with giant trees in the inside all natural lighting so like like natural like 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 um you know uv like lighting some, yeah, so like, and yeah, yeah, so like, yeah yeah yes so, so they have that and everything like that parameters completely chill and just release like five of them in that cage and just just cameras everywhere so i can see how they work but like just let them live naturally as possible to see what happens i would just i would love that to see how they're acting how would that change them and everything like that because i mean i i don't know if you saw that video i posted where it was like 45 minutes of this tree monitor and i and i time lapsed real fast so it was like 45 minutes of this animal and in 45 minutes my female who's like gravid now right she's been breeding she went up and down every single inch of the cage in 45 minutes she did that right and that's a it's a pretty large cage but to a tree monitor that's not large so to see what they would do in the wild man i i just that would just be amazing dude honestly literally bring a slice of jurassic park here that's what i would build man my own tree monitor jurassic park that'd be great man that'd be pretty cool that'd be cool i, I think definitely people would definitely be lined up to watch it you know come and see it and stuff like that because <laughs> yeah. um, you know no one, I don't think anybody's doing anything like that or has the capability of doing that um, with any yeah. species of reptiles right now. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. I, I, I'm a fan, you know what I'm a fan of? Um, what's it called? Monkey tail skinks. Have you seen them? Those are beautiful. Yeah, beautiful animals. Yeah, I um, like them. I just, I just haven't, um, I, I know people that are breeding them and stuff like that. I just haven't, uh, what's it called? Committed to getting one because I know they need, at least to my, to me, right? They need a cage set up like you do, like you have, and they're communal. So you need to have more, I mean, you need to have more than just a pair. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so like w- one of my biggest things is um, if I grow, if I, you know, get more hoggles and stuff like that, and I outgrow this room, I want to convert my garage into my reptile room. So yeah. there's this one wall that's about 10 feet long. I was like, I want to be build like a really badass enclosure. And then get some cool. uh, like a, a handful of like you know um, monkey tail skinks and just put them in there and let them be, you know, let them be there the animal they need to be. And stuff like that. That would be cool. Yeah, I got. Yeah. I have. A, I have a thirty foot, thirty foot by I think it's like eighteen foot basement. That's what I keep my animals mm-hmm. in. And right now, right now my cages uh, span one wall, one one of the thirty foot walls right here, right. And uh, and I would love to hopefully 
take all the walls, but I gotta convince my I gotta convince my partner to let me do that, dude. So I can get more animals. I hear that. Out of here, but, uh, I hear that. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's one thing I wish we had in, in Florida basements, man. It, it would change, yeah, yeah. you know, like I have my garage, but if I had a basement, it would change the game, you know. Like I wouldn't yeah, even have yeah. to think about converting my garage. I just do right, everything right. in my basement. Yeah. yeah, I have a garage too, but I use that to like make and build dumb shit yeah. so I can't put the animals yeah. in there. And plus in New York City, it gets cold in the wintertime, so it's just not the best pace for them or anything like that, you mm-hmm. know? Yeah, like, like, but I like wish a, I was in know. Florida, dude, because if I was in Florida, I'd be I'd be like the, the like the crush fields and just build eight like just cages, acres of cages on my on my mm-hmm. property if I had property, but that's what I would do out there, man. Yeah, man. I, I have a friend that uh that does uh turtles and I live um on the outskirts of miami so um like a block away from me i have farmlands right they're called yeah, the yeah, yeah. and i have a friend that has his dad has five acres out there and they do um they're doing turtles so they have like just you know they have just pin the the pins of the turtle and they just have a uh, like the shade netting above and they just have yeah, the yeah, turtles yeah. you know roaming around and stuff like that you know, that's cool so, though, man yeah yeah it's pretty cool i was like man i wish i had that on that that land to be able to do something like yeah. that too yeah you know? mm-hmm. but uh it, it's i mean in miami in new york any major city to buy land it's super expensive. yeah forget you about know? it it's forget insane about it. it's insane yeah, you can't you know? do that here uh, Definitely no, can't do that you here. can't you can't unless you move i mean even if you move like upstate it's still got to be super expensive right and then the yeah, weather's yeah. not the greatest either so Hell it's no, and then co- commuting know. too, like work isn't as well or anything like that. But who wants to live? Mm-hmm. Like I don't know. If you grew up in the city, who wants to live outside of the city? You know, that's the hard part as well. You know, eventually I want to retire out to like, you know, like the redwoods or something like that, of like Northern California or something. You know, but like mm-hmm. I right now I just enjoy the city too much. The conveniences that I have here and being able to get wherever I want easily or get whatever I want out here. You know, like. That's what I really love about being in New York City at the moment, you know. But it comes with the sure, challenges. Man. Like, like to find this place was like a diamond in the rough to be able to find a place with a space this big to have these animals, you know. So, give and take, yeah. you know. <laughs> I can imagine, man. I can imagine that. Um, do you, you know, and, and this is going to be a, a double question. Do you have any actual reptile brand other than yours that you support that that you think are, is creating good? um products or has good customer service that maybe you use or, or are you like custom making term? and use just like any any reptile product you know lighting heating um you oh know, yeah anything. so so funny enough man i just and this is a plug to these guys man shout out i just got picked up as a sponsor for a uh, uh universal rock so universal rock okay, cool. those, dudes, those guys are sick as hell you know they uh they see that I have the cages. They saw that the, the whole the build out that I did and everything like that. And the next thing that I was going to be doing was building out large, uh, large, uh, big rock walls that I was going to do myself. Well, they saw these and contacted me, and they wanted to hook it up. And they're we're about to get these all these cages decked out with Universal Rock. Um, in terms of other products that I use for these animals, um, I breed a lot of my own insects and I breed a lot of my own stuff and I make a lot of my own products with the 3D printed stuff. There's, there isn't a lot of stuff that I use from elsewhere other than like Arcadia. I swear by Arcadia lighting. I love their lighting. All the testing that they do and everything like that on their stuff, I believe in it 100%. After that, man, um, shout out to Lowe's because Lowe's got all the products that I need to build my cage. <laughs> <laughs> See, so we, need, we need to work on, need to work on a sponsorship from Lowe's, man. <laughs> Yeah. yeah no but i agree man Ar- arcadia um we once we switched our, our bearded dragon um he's not even a year old we switched him over about a month ago um to a four foot by two by two by two foot enclosure and we went to the arcadia uv and then we also um went from a um you know like a heat lamp to the dp uh emitters yeah 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 and man, it you can tell it, it makes a difference in the animal the way that he's behaving. Um, he's actually using his hide now because the 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 heat is actually creating the hide so he can get heat yeah. in there. It's really really interesting. Um, yeah, how their, you know, they, their products work. Yeah, those dudes did a lot of testing and research, and I'm part of like the reptile research lighting forums online and everything like that. So I'm reading all of the reports, and those guys are like some big 
big, you know, disrespect nerds when it comes to reptile lighting. And they yeah. really deep dive behind the science, behind what these projectors are doing, what these lights are doing, the different lumens, how these lights interact with the animals on different wavelengths and things like that. Like it's really interesting stuff that they're finding out. And so the biggest thing that they always report back is that Arcadia has their stuff together. So that's why I trust them and I love them and I, I'm gonna continue to use them for sure. I agree, man. Yeah, and Universal Rock, the same thing, man. I, I've looked into them too. Um, pretty, they got some really cool stuff um, doing with the reptile, yeah. like rocks and all that stuff. It's really cool. So, the, the if you're, are you able to talk on it? Like, are are you are they gonna um, help you like rebuild some of your cages? Give you like the rock formations to put into your enclosures? Yeah, they're they're decking out the entire the walls on all my cages. So they're nice, they're, they're sending out they're they're sending me out their their uh their panels, large panels to fill them all out and everything like that for my cages. Because again. I was gonna build them out with fake rock walls, but the problem with building out your own rock walls is like, when I build them out, I build them out with foam and cement, and that gets real heavy real quick. Real quick, it gets real heavy. Uh, and so Universal Rock saw this and said, hey, you wanna try this product out that I think you'll love a lot better. It's easier to work with. And as they're right, it's made out of like, you know, a, a urethane rubber that's easy to clean, that looks, that's molded from rocks, and all you have to do is like screw it in place or fix it in place. And now you have an entire rock wall that's a million times lighter than cement is, you know? Like I do really nice work when it comes to realistic fake rock walls. And you can see some of my old vid videos of my older enclosures where I do my own fake rock walls. And I, I was waiting to do these guys, but they hit me up in the right time. And they were like, hey, we want to help you out. So yeah, man, if you're looking for something that's easy to use, easy to maintain, easy to kind of sanitize, those guys are definitely the wave that I recommend. It's a, it's on the, it, you know, it's an investment product, but it's something that once you get it, you'll never have to replace it. You know, it's always going to last for you. So I'm excited nice to try one. it out. I'm excited to put it into my cages. That's great. That's great. Um, so we're going to start wrapping this up. Um, I have one major question before we get on, um, you know, wrap it up. It's if you had the, attention of the whole world for five minutes, what would you tell them? The attention of the world for five minutes, about anything, any type of thing for about any, animals? Anything, anything, about anything. Life, animals, anything that you would want the world to know. If I had the attention for five minutes, I would tell the entire world to stop stressing about other people and worry about the things that you want to do that you're passionate about in life. Don't ever let anybody tell you you can't do anything and, and just be as confident in your, as yourself and whatever that you're doing to be the best as you can at that thing. Too many times I see too many people being afraid to try different things and try to innovate and, and, and be passionate about something because they heard someone else and someone else told them you can't do this and you're not good enough and you'll never be successful or anything like that. If there's anything in this world that you want to do, don't let anybody on this living earth stop you from doing that, from chasing your dreams, from doing the things you want to do in this life. You only get one life. You only get one freaking life, right? And like you said, man, time's valuable. You don't get any of this back. Once that day is over, you don't get none of this back. So don't stress about someone else trying to put you down, a hater, uh, uh, someone that's not supportive of you or anything like that, man. If there's anything in this God-given earth, I don't care if you want to be the best mozzarella cheese maker in the world or if you want to be the best mechanic in the world or you want to be the best blue tree monitor keeper in the world be the best that you can be believe in yourself and i promise you man the world's going to repay you the world's going to show you that they appreciate you that's the best advice that i can give you if i have five minutes i'd spread that message so hard and so passionately so everybody can feel that around the world, man. That's that's what I'd say. <laughs> that's a good one, man. I, I, I agree with you, man. I think we get caught up in the rat race and trying to impress people and trying to live up to, you know, either parents' uh, thoughts about us, you know, ideas, our friends and stuff like that, where, like, we forget what really makes us happy and what we really want to do in life, right? Yeah, um, dude. Yeah, bro. Too many people, yeah, I, I see too many know. people like give up. Too many people give up on what they want to do in life. Too many people like they don't want to, you know, take that trip because they're afraid they're, they're, you know, whatever someone said that it doesn't make sense or or they don't want to 
working for a certain animal because someone else told them not to or something like that. Like if I would have listened to everybody when I got into the tree monitors, I wouldn't be where I'm at right now working with them. I would have never got into them if I would have listened to everyone being like, you're a novice person, you shouldn't do this. Or if I didn't go with the route of these big cages, I would have never seen what I've seen with these animals. You know, that's just like a small example of that. You know, if I would have listened to everyone in my whole life, I would never be where I'm at right now. I'm, a, you know, I'm confident in that sense that I can, I can say that if there's something I want to do, I'm going to do it and I don't care what anybody else thinks about it, you know? So yeah, man, that's yeah. the advice I can give. I, I agree. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? I think most reptile keepers, we've already taken that step just by keeping reptiles because, you know, yeah. being Latinos and stuff like that, you know, you tell yeah. your family members and <laughs> stuff like that. And I'm keeping these lizards, these, you know, I'm keeping yeah, right? these, these snakes, stuff like, what? You're crazy, man. Like, <laughs> we eat why, those. Yeah. Right? My mom just said we eat those in the island. I was like, <laughs> okay. yeah. Yeah, man. Um, so it, it's funny because, like, you know, when as an adult now, you know, I'm 30, 34 years old, and getting back into the reptile thing with my daughters and stuff like that. Um, I felt a little weird telling my friends, my adult professional friends that are either, you know, big business people, doctors, and, you know, all these different types of professionals. Hey, man, I'm having, I'm having, I'm starting to, uh, you know, breeding reptiles and stuff like that. And you get those looks like, what, why, man? You were like, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's like, because I like it, you know, and, and that's, yeah, exactly. you don't get that a lot from people. Why are you doing yeah. it? Oh, just because you like it? You know, yeah, it's, right? like, it, it, it's different. Yeah. It's different, man. Yeah, exactly. It's like, yeah. why do you, why do you go, why do you go play golf for 10 hours of the day shooting a, a ball into a little hole? Why? Right? Like, I don't question yeah. you doing that. Like, it's the same thing. Yeah. It's different, yeah, right? It's true. It's true, man. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and like I tell my wife, man, like right now I'm in, I've been in the, like the construction field and stuff like that uh, for the last maybe was seven, eight years and stuff of like that, different, you know, different facets of it. And it, it, it's, it's a good job. It pays the bills and stuff of like that, but I'm not passionate about it. Right. So I tell them, I, I tell where my thoughts is like, if I can get the reptile stuff to be a full-time job and put all my effort into this would be my dream come true right now. Um, and, and I think with these I definitely have found that, dream job and what I was missing to make me happy as, um, you know, within life to be able to produce something that also can feed my family and keep a roof yeah. over our head and stuff like that, you know? And, and it's funny. I was telling my friend, I was like, I don't care about being a millionaire because I really don't. As long as I can live comfortable and have a comfortable life for my children, you know, I'll be happy. Yeah, man. Um, you know? That's all I need to yeah. man. Exactly. For sure. You know, I think in, that, in, I think in, in a, a reptile facility. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, that's right. Like, if if, if I can put sink a million dollars into a reptile facility, that would be great, right? Uh, but like, actually living like a millionaire every day, or like, yeah, you know, I mean, so like these crazy, you know, wealthy, rich people, I don't need it. Um, I really don't. Um, you know, if, if I could spend all day in a reptile facility, like you said, or or build, you know, something like you said, you want you would build if you had a million dollars for your tree monitors. That would be a lifelong accomplishment, and you will enjoy that a lot more than you will enjoy, I think, a fancy car or some jewelry and stuff like that, right? One hundred percent, man. One hundred percent, because that's only it's only useful until the next year when no one gives a shit about it anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Where the animals are here forever, they're gonna be here as long yeah. as I take care of them. They're gonna be here for me, so that's sure, more rewarding man. in my sense. Yeah, and you know what, man? I I realized that. With all of this like technology, social media, and stuff like that that we have um, as humankind, I think we're also yearning, and people are seeking out more nature, more animals, more like tangible things in their life. Um, and I think this is a way to do it too, right? Like us, captain breeding these animals, you know, maybe it's a way to get us back to that naturalistic way of living, right? Um, yeah, man, I agree. I, agree. I, I think sometimes we're so engulfed within the, the the technology, the social media and stuff that where we forget that there's a whole world out there. Yeah, man. I, I, I would say I say this too, man. If you give a, a pet like animal to a kid and you teach them how to properly take care of this, it would change their life. 
I would rather my kid be looking up information on how to take care of a leopard gecko all day versus them scrolling mindlessly through TikTok or Instagram. I'd rather do that 100%, you know? And if I can instill that in my future kids, like, hey, look, be as passionate as, or, 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 or just check this out. Look at these animals. Look at the world that these animals can bring you. You know, the excitement, the joy, the learning that you'll get from these animals. Check it out over a video games or anything. I'm going to try that 100%, you know? I can only imagine it's nothing but good for them. It is, man. I, like I guess I have my two daughters. I have, she's one is twelve years old, and the one, and my little one's seven. And when they come in this room, or when I'm in here, what are you doing? Can we help? You know, can I help? You know, wasn't my daughter came from school today? I picked her up from school, came home, and the first thing is, can I hold some snakes? You know, like, <laughs> that's cool. Man. What, yeah, what yeah. more than you want from that, right? Like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. You know, so it, it's pretty amazing, and you can see that they're they're learning hands on with something they're, you know, they're learning to take care of a live animal, especially something like snakes and reptiles where it's not common or it's more work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it definitely nurtures that, that mentality of, of, uh, you know, thinking and, and, and being a caregiver and stuff. Um, yeah. And even confidence. I know grown men that are afraid of snakes that won't even touch yeah. a snake, right? You're telling yeah. me your daughter's over here touching snakes. So like, yeah. It goes to show, imagine how much forward she's going to be in life when this is not even a fear she's going to have. When she's going to be able to embrace yeah. animals and not be afraid of animals. Like, that's a beautiful yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. And, like, one, they've gotten over one fear so far. Um, you know, our bearded dragon, like you said, um, we started uh, getting, uh, started our own roach colony because it was getting really expensive, really fast feeding the yeah. bearded dragon. <laughs> yeah. Even just one, right? Like, have yeah, to go, yeah, yeah. especially just have to go every weekend to the reptile shop and buy, you know, a 20 Cricket thing of roaches, or, yeah. roaches. It was just getting way too much. I was like, I'm just going to start the colony. Um, so they are definitely of like roaches, bugs and stuff like that. Um, but now they'll come in here into the bin and grab the roaches and feed it to the bearded dragon and stuff like that. So yeah. already they're, you know, starting to get over things because they're realizing, okay, this, ant, this little insect's not going to do anything to me. You know, right. and they needed to feed their beater dragon and stuff. Right, right. That's cool. Yeah, sure, man. So any uh, last words before, you know, you want, you know, the people watching and stuff like that to know before we get up um, in this live? Yeah, man. If, like, like I said, my name's Eddie. I'm the guy behind Father Blue, the, the hopefully the biggest and best uh, Blue Tree Monitor content on the internet right now and everything like that. And I want to say that if there's any questions, any concerns you got any like you want any tips and tricks on how to take care of tree monitors or how to build enclosures or 3d printing advice or anything of that matter shoot me a line on my instagram or, or or shoot me an email or anything like that i got a bunch of platforms i'm father blue on instagram i'm father blue on youtube father blue on facebook i even got a website www.fatherblue.com which is my it's my blog and everything like that um that i've started posting all the information that i'm putting up so all the stories that you see and everything like that on Instagram, I'm going in detail now, putting like write-ups of them online on fatherblue.com. So if you guys want to check that out, please give it a shout. Uh, give it a check out if you want to read some of the stuff that I'm doing or anything like that there. Um, and again, if there's, if you guys want to chat, talk or anything like that, I'm always available. I'm always free. I love to talk about tree monitors. And I say this, all, I always say this, the more people that get into this stuff, that means there's more people I get to talk to about tree monitors as well. And that, that's only cool, you know, in my opinion. So, yeah, man, I'm always here for you guys. And I love the community and I love where it's heading. And I can only see it growing from here, man. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah, for sure. And I got to say, like you said, you know, hitting you up. I messaged you um, on Instagram. You want to be on podcast. And you instantly said yes. It wasn't like, oh, what's it about? This and that. You said, yeah, sure. You know? Yeah, um, dude. You know. 100%. So, definitely, you know, make sure you guys go follow him on all his social media. Um, I added the link down below in the descriptions. I didn't know about the website, so I'm going to add the link after to your website yeah, also in the description. Um, you know, so make sure you guys follow him. Um, I, you have a YouTube too, right? I have a YouTube. Um, it's it's, so, it's yeah. not updated yet, but it's going to it's gonna keep on being updated currently. I'm pushing the social media stuff real heavy just because I want to grow the platforms, everything that I'm doing, you know, just to bring awareness of my projects. The more eyes that I have on it, the better the projects can go. I, the more people can learn about these animals, you know, 
I want to be the Steve Irwin yeah. of, of tree monitors at one day, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you have the Dominican Steve Irwin of tree monitors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For sure, man. Um, you know, and then I was like, I always finish any of my social media, like my YouTube and stuff like that. Make sure to go out and support US Art, US Art Florida. Um, go down in the description. Make sure you contact the governor of Florida to uh, get your thoughts about what happened recently and just general thoughts about what you care about your reptiles and um, the community. Because when they see that they are, this is important to us, they will put light on it and they will, um, you know, give us a voice in a, in a, a platform to be able to get it out to more yeah. people and politicians and stuff like that. Um, and thank you for everybody that joined in. Um, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks for everybody.